You can also support Soho House by buying their delicious cocktails at the bar. Um, this is actually our, our, our last uh, Cocktails and Conversations event at Soho House, I believe. But we will be doing, we will be expanding our, uh, our events and speaking series. So if you have not given us your email address on the way in, please do so on the way out, and we'll make sure that you're invited to our future Cocktails and Conversations events. Um, so, uh, one of the great pleasures of, of working at Helio and working with all these amazing writers and, and thinkers is uh, that we get to see all the different ways that people become these extraordinary influential writers. And what, one thing I found kind of interesting is that every, every kind of wildly successful business leader eventually writes a book, or most do, and, uh, and, every, uh, and every wild, wildly successful writer eventually becomes a business, becomes a one-person media company. So there's this convergence of sort of, in, in the one-person media company, of this, it's sort of the, uh, I, I think we all may be, all, all of us uh, loquacious Americans aspire to eventually end up a thought leader like these two folks on the stage. Both of them have come, have arrived in this place from different, uh, uh, from these two different, different directions. The, the incomparable Sarah Rob O'Hagan uh, is, um, as you may know, she, she is a high-powered business executive, uh, one of our very favorite people uh, at, at Helio, as is Simon. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was previously president of, of Gatorade, of Equinox. She's now the CEO of Flywheel. <laughs> and uh, one, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes of all time was from an Amazon.com engineer who said about the, about the great Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos makes ordinary control freaks look like stone hippies. Uh, if that's true, Sarah Rob O'Hagan makes ordinary, hyper-enthusiastic people look like somnambulant monks. Uh, Sarah Rob O'Hagan is a force. Um, as uh, there, there, uh, Cheryl Sandberg said, Sarah doesn't just sit at the table, she stands on it. Um, Adam Grant says she's a badass of the highest order. Uh, Sarah has written this, uh, her new book has just come out, Extreme You, with one of my favorite subtitles ever, Step Up, Stand Up, Kick Ass, Repeat. And very importantly, there's a period after each of those statements, which I like. If it becomes, it wouldn't have been the same thing. Um, and it, Extreme You, so if you haven't bought Extreme You, you certainly will be buying it by the end of this. We have copies here, um, so uh, you have that to look forward to. Uh, Simon Sinek uh, is, 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 I'm sure, um, needs no introduction, but uh, I first encountered Simon Sinek, as many of you probably did, uh, via his TED Talk, which we were talking earlier. It started as a TEDx talk with remarkably shoddy production values uh, and a radic microphone. He had like a, you know, there was like a piece, a large poster board, and he had a pen, and it really just, it, 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 it's, it's difficult to ignore how bad the production values are. He shared, he shared this vision about, um, you know, start with why, the, the importance of, of, of building companies and building your life with purpose, and it resonated so dramatically that, that it's now, I think, the third most watched TED Talk ever, it's been seen over 30 million times. Um, and uh, so Simon now, he's written three extraordinary books, Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last, and um, a wonderful book that we have here uh, that's a, um, a very interesting combination of an in inspirational book that you can buy on your way out. Um, and um, so Simon currently teaches at Columbia and travels the world sharing his wisdom. An extraordinary example of both the resonance of Simon's wisdom and the power of social media is that a, a subset of, of, a, of an in interview, a conversation that Simon did a few, uh, maybe a couple months ago, um, was uh, about millennials. Was, uh, you may have seen this, it was forwarded to me by multiple people. It was shared 1.2 million times and seen 60 million times. And uh, millennials, the subject of millennials is, is um, also something addressed in, in Sarah's book, so this may be something that comes up tonight. 
uh, we millennials are, are very curious about the, uh, the mysterious phenomenon of us. Uh, so with, with no further ado, uh, Sarah and Simon. All right. I believe it's 160 million views, just to clarify. Woo! Wow. So I want to start by um, a little story of how I actually got to meet Simon, because I am a fangirl. I did stalk you. That's not true. Because I was one of the people who watched the shoddily produced Start With Why video. How many people have watched that TED talk? Like, it's extraordinary how it took over the world. And at the time that I was in the middle of the biggest firestorm of my life, trying to turn around a $5 billion sports drink business, and we just couldn't get ourselves organized, and I suddenly see this video presented to me by a group of people, and it led us as Gatorade to find our why. And long story short, this was like one of the biggest business turnarounds in history that eventually turned around and has gone on to be extraordinarily successful. So I started tweet stalking him and sending him pictures of our why, how, what, <laughs> because I wanted him to know that he is one of the biggest reasons that we got it together, because he helped us find who we were. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to um, be in conversation with, with Simon is, how many of you have seen the Millennial video, by the way? It's incredible. And um, I really, I, we, we had coffee a week or so ago, and I was like, you have framed the opportunity, and I truly believe my book is the um, solution for those Millennial in the audience. But what I wanted to do is like, have everyone hear a little bit more about who Simon is underneath all of this, because he has all this great wisdom that he shared with so many of us, but what I love the most about Simon is he truly is what I would call an extremer, because he has gone through extraordinary twists and turns in his life to get where he is. So I wanted to start by asking you about the topic of kind of, and it came up a little bit in, in your video, how you have developed your own resilience, and it's interesting to me that I think Many people don't realize that Simon Sinek, the world famous like guy behind Star With Why, there was many, many months, if not years, where Star With Why was not so well known. And how did you stick with it? So I made the single biggest mistake I think any individual can make, especially a small business that small business owner can make, which is what I was a bunch of years ago, uh, which is I thought I had to know all the answers. If I didn't, I thought I had to pretend that I did. And uh, it is a very lonely existence, I will say, and no one helps you. And uh, the reason no one helps you is because I would present myself as knowing all the answers or pretending that I did, and so people wouldn't help me because I had all the answers. And it became uh, lonelier and lonelier to the point where I hated going to work, I hated owning a business, um, I didn't want to wake up and do it again, and all of my energy went to pretending that I was happier, more successful, and more in control than I actually felt. <laughs> and it wasn't until a very close friend of mine came to me concerned that there was something wrong with me that that gave me the courage to admit that I couldn't do it. And so my resilience, like every human being on the planet, is not some deep down internal something or other. It comes from the people around me. Um, I'm very lucky that I'm surrounded by people who ask me, are you okay, who say, how can I help? And that I feel safe enough to say, I'm struggling, I don't know what to do, and I don't know the answer. And it's amazing that we're all surrounded by people who want to help us, and we would just admit that we needed help. And people come rushing. Always. But if we fake it, lie, hide, and fake every day, then no, nobody shows up. So um, that's how Start With Why I was born. It was a solution to my own malaise, and I never expected it to become what it became. It was just a solution meant for me. I shared it with my friends. It worked my friends. My friends were starting businesses just because of the silly little idea. I would, the whole speaking thing started when I would go to somebody's apartment in New York City and stand in their living room and talk about this thing called the why. And I would help people find their why for a hundred bucks on the side. <laughs> it's true. And, uh, um, but I had a clear vision and I had a clear sense of what I could contribute to. And I learned myself having gone through this remarkable transition of hating my life to loving my life, to hating my work to loving my work, that, um, uh, that, that fulfillment, which is different than excitement and happiness. You can be excited or happy if you win the business, get a promotion, 
get a book, you know, get a bonus, whatever. Uh, that's fantastic, but it goes away. Nobody, nobody in this room is walking around with an amazing sense of accomplishment for that big goal you hit a year ago. Um, fulfillment is something different. It's like love. You know, you don't like your children every day, but you love your children. Every day. You don't like your friends every day, but you love your friends every day. Fulfillment is like love. And I firmly believe that fulfillment in our work is a right and not a privilege. And we treat it like a privilege. We treat it like, like somebody won some sort of lottery. You know, you go out with your friends and somebody at the table says, I love my job. And the rest of us go, you're so lucky. Right? <laughs> like they won something. And I wholly reject that. That, 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 is a, that is a right and not a privilege. And it is uh, that we have the right to demand that those for whom we work Give us an environment in which we love showing up every day. We don't have to like it every day, but we do get to love it every day. And uh, if we are the leaders, then we have the responsibility to provide that to the people who, who, are, who are in our charge. Um, and I knew that years ago. And so when Start With Why came out, I didn't care, and still don't care, whether it reaches some New York Times bestseller list or something. It's an arbitrary pile of nonsense. And by arbitrary, I mean nobody really knows how you get on the list. <laughs> uh, but if you're lucky enough to get on TV on Monday, odds are you can get on the bestseller list by Friday. <clears throat> uh, it's true. Uh, so anyway, the point is, I knew that I had to advance this message, advance this world that I imagined, and I would do it in any way, shape, or form I could, whether I spoke about it, taught it, you know, advised, wrote books, wrote articles, blog, tweeted, I didn't care, I just had to advance this. And so I allowed Start With Why to do whatever it needed to do, like your kid. Like, you don't expect your kid to get their first job, you know, at 17 or 18 or 19. But you sort of, like, there's a process, and it's okay how long it takes, as long as there's movement. And that was always my attitude, and still is towards Start With Why. But talk to me a little bit about, because um, <clears throat> one of the things that you and I have discussed is that, um, particularly sort of younger generations coming into the workforce, there is like statistically a lot of job hopping going on right now. Like, oh gosh, I'm not at the perfect job. It's not meeting my expectations. It's not right. I've got to move on. Yeah. And there's a wonderful person in the room, who I, John is his name, who taught me about last year when I was doing the research for my book about the fact that you can't find your passion by putting it into a Google search. You actually have to make your passion. And yeah. I would imagine that those years of blogging, all the stuff that you were doing, were not easy, were a hard grind, and you didn't know where it was going to go, but you chose to stick with it. So here's a true story. A friend of mine who's 30 years old uh, called me up for advice. Uh, did I tell you this before? No. She was contemplating quitting her job, and she wanted my advice whether she should quit or not. So my first question is, how long have you been there? And she said, Four months. <laughs> so I said, is your boss absolutely a horrible human being who's abusing you every day that you, you got to get out of there? She goes, no, no, he's a, he's a nice guy. I said, is he supportive of you? She goes, yeah, yeah, he is. I said, uh, are you not getting paid enough to pay your bills? She says, no, no, I'm making more money than I've ever made. <laughs> I said, then, work me through this one, I'm struggling. She goes, well, I'm not doing the work I want to do. Which is a very common thing I hear in the millennial generation. Like, I'm not doing, this is not what I want to do. So I said to her, have you told your boss? She said, yeah. I said, what did he say? He goes, okay, I get it, but I want you to do this for now. And I got it. So I'm, I said to her, so are you telling me that he sees potential in you that maybe you don't see? She said, mm-hmm. I said, yeah, get over yourself and stay in your job. It's really good. It's really good. Like, it's really good. And stick with this. Get good at this. He clearly sees something in you, and he says he'll move you. He'll move you. Like, there may be some lessons to learn here. She goes, thank you, thank you, thank you. A month later, she quit. Wait, wait, wait. Without another job. So the option for nothing was better than the story that she was telling herself that her life was over, her career was over, because she was doing something I don't want to do. And, and I, I'm fascinated by this, which is, and I, it's very common in, the, in, 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 the, in this younger generation now, which is nothing is the better option, or as they call it, entrepreneurship. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> yet not having a job and saying you work for yourself is not the same thing. Uh, you actually actually have a business and sell something of value to somebody else that they want to buy, and then you may have a business. Maybe. Maybe. And then over 90% of those are going to fail, because those are the statistics. So I think the work that you talk about is profoundly important, which is there are less, not all lessons, it's a little bit of karate kid. You're like not all the lessons are obvious to us. And not all the work is work we want to do. No, nobody wants to be junior. Nobody likes being junior. I was the worst junior person in the world. Because when you're junior, you have to be good at everything. And only when you get seniors, you get to be good at like a thing, right? And then you don't have to be good. It's good. <laughs> and, yeah. But when you're junior, it sucks. That's the point. And I think one of the reasons for the job hopping is, um, is because they, they don't like the suck, and so they leave it. And I'm so lucky, as are you, that I had somebody, I had a boss who cared about me, who wanted to see me grow, who saw a potential in me that I didn't see, and I sucked it up because I trusted them. And so there's a weird lack of trust that's, that maybe somebody is looking at it. And you don't have to have all the answers. So I think, you know, your work about grit and, uh, and stick with itness is uh, is a very important lesson. Because I also think it goes hand in hand with, I believe we have, or at least my research would say, we our, our culture has shifted to this culture of perfection. And if you come out of college today, you have to be perfectly quaff on Instagram. You have to have a perfect resume. You have to have the perfect first job. You cannot screw up. Like, I don't remember ever feeling any of those pressures. Like, I had massive eyebrows, just to be clear, when I came out of college, like, National Forest, and, like, I didn't realize that was a bad thing. It wasn't all over Instagram, right? And today, no, but I feel like today there's so much pre pressure to keep up with the Joneses, have ever going to be perfect, yet if you just dig in and do what might not look perfect, it will help you in the end. It's like, I, I, where's my flywheelers in the back? Give it, give it up for flywheelers. Like, woo! In the woo! Front. Woo! <laughs> in the front. <laughs> in the front. I can't say, like, I ever would have known that the grind of, like, working and understanding freaking airline seat capacities would ever be relevant in the rest of my life, ever. Oh, look, we're putting bums on a different kind of seat in this business, but, you know, you don't know that early on. So what's your thought on the perfection issue? Well, there's an irony, right? Because everybody knows, everybody knows intellectually that perfection is not true. And so when people present themselves as perfect, and we've all been sitting in a meeting or, or in a more like a sales call where whoever's trying to sell something has every answer to every problem we have, and they are uncredible, right? Uh, we all know that perfection is, is impossible, and so when you go on a date and somebody presents themselves as perfect and tries to convince you to perfect, we all know it's a scam, it's a lie, it's a front. They're broken, don't trust them. And it's still fun. Right, yeah. <laughs>
You and I were talking last week about the whole topic of failure or overcoming imperfections. And one of the things I love that Simon said, and I want him to, to share with this group, is um, sometimes those imperfections in your earlier years become yeah. your greatest strengths. And you personally have an extraordinary story that I was not familiar with. I don't know if it's extraordinary. I think it's pretty normal. Uh, I firmly believe that the solutions we find to the challenges when we're children become our strengths as adults, become our, whatever you want to call it, unique selling proposition. <laughs> so I was a kid who absolutely had ADD, without a doubt, and thank God nobody diagnosed me. <laughs> because then they would have put me on a pill and I wouldn't have had to find solutions to my problems. And the problem was I could not concentrate and I couldn't read a book because I couldn't focus long enough to read a book. The problem is I still have to get through school. And so I learned very young that I'd either fail and be depressed or I got to figure something out. And so I got very, very good at asking questions. I got very, very good at listening. And I got very, very good at sort of Dare, I mean, I, I mean this as a little kid thing, not as an adult thing, but being a little bit charming that people would even want to help me. <laughs> like, teachers loved me, right? Because, and then I could go after class and, I, I, you know, pummel them with questions and they would answer all of them. And by the time I got to college, I was smart enough to know to not take classes uh, where it was heavy in reading or... I could never skip class. I never skipped a class in college. Because if I skipped class, I couldn't make up for it with the book. I had to listen. So I had to have a good professor who was good at explaining things. And I would always go after class and always ask questions because that's how I learned to learn. Well, guess what my entire career is? Listening and asking questions and, uh, uh, and, and somehow inviting people to help me or explain things to me because... I'm not that smart because I can't Did read it in a book. Did you have good grades, by the way? Were you good? That's not a fair question. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I'll sound like my parents, which is, have I only applied myself more? <laughs> I was a solid B student. Yeah. I'm a firm believer. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that they should give out grades as ratios, <laughs> which is the grade you achieve, I. which is the grade you achieve over the number of hours you study. <laughs> right? So I was a B over two. And I know plenty of people who are A over 400. Well, what about if you're B over 400? Right? I was the super or, nerd or B who over just didn't do so, so well. So, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's not that a B student is worse than an A student. Yeah. It's, as a ratio, it means if you need perfection and you have the time to allow someone to work on it, you hire an A over a 400. If you're okay with good enough, yeah. but you just got to get stuff going, you hire a B over yeah. two. I would be over two. I think I would not get higher. That's yeah. the only issue. I be, suck on both ratios. Yeah. C over 400. It's <laughs> not working. Like maybe career change. Uh, so um, now I want to change a little bit and talk about risk taking. Because um, I don't know if it came up in your video, but one of the things that I've certainly found from my research is that Actually, every generation from the boomers to Gen X to millennials, and I'm sure my kids will be worse, have become more and more risk averse. And the fear of failure is actually one of the single biggest things <coughs> that hold, holds people back. And I'm curious for you, because you made some big decisions early in your life. Like when you made the decision to get out of the agency business and go out on your own, and you were offered all the many reasons to not do that of safety, where does the courage to take risks come from? How do you frame that in your mind? I won't, I cannot accept that I was courageous. I, I, naive, I think, is more accurate. I, I, naivete is my greatest asset. Um, but, but let's talk about courage, because I know people who really have courage, which is not me. Uh, and I, as I said before, I do not believe that courage is some deep down internal thing that you find. I think courage is external. I've had the privilege of getting to meet people who you and I would call heroes, people who have actually risked their lives to save the lives of other people, sometimes people they don't even know. And I've asked them, uh, why did you do it? You've got a spouse, you've got kids, no one would have faulted you if you didn't do it, no one would have ordered you to do it, why did you do it? And they all give the same answer, because they would have done it for me. And so <clears throat> there, was a, there was a Navy SEAL so BUDS is basic underwater demolition, which is 
what the seal selection process. It's a grueling, grueling. You see, I'm sure you may have seen documentaries, videos of them lifting telephone poles and sitting in the ocean, freezing cold. That's buds. And it's the selection they use to decide who should or shouldn't be a seal. And there was a, a, a former seal who was asked, who makes it through buds? Who be, who, who make, who, who, who's good enough to become a seal? And this was his answer. He said, he says, um, he says, I can't tell you who makes it through buds, but I can tell you who doesn't make it through buds. He says, the preening leaders who like to delegate all the responsibility, none of them make it through. He says, the star college athletes who've never really been tested to the core of their being, none of them make it through. He says, the guys covered in tattoos and bulging muscles who want to show you how strong and how tough they are, none of them make it through. He says, some of the guys who make it through are skinny and scrawny. He said, some of the guys who make it through, you will see them shivering out of fear. He says, but all of the guys who make it through, when they are physically and emotionally exhausted, when they have nothing left to give whatsoever, somehow, some way, they are able to dig down deep inside of themselves to find the energy to help the guy next to them. Those are the ones that become seals. Now, these are our most elite warriors on the planet, and being the biggest and the boldest and the strongest is not what makes them elite. It's the intense energy they have to protect each other. And yet we, for some reason, have the completely opposite standard in business where we reward the one who presents themselves as the biggest and the boldest, but we ignore the ones who would sacrifice themselves to take care of each other. And if our most elite warriors on the planet are the caregivers, then maybe we should learn something from them. So anything that I've ever done that others would label of me courageous, make no mistake of it, I had people to the left of me and I had people to the right of me and they said to me, no matter what happens, we got your back. That is the only reason I had any strength whatsoever to do anything difficult that I've ever done or do anything that is perceived as risky is I knew that there were people beside me who no matter what would pick me up. No trapeze artist would ever try a death-defying new act without a net. You wouldn't. Later on, maybe, but not the first time. So why would any of us do the same? That net is called a friend. That net is called a trusted leader. That net is called a trusted colleague. You know? And if we don't work hard to cultivate those relationships, if we don't ha work hard to offer ourselves as that person to others, if we as leaders do not work hard to build those cultures and as we as employees do not demand that our leaders provide those cultures to us and for us, then no one has any courage to do anything. And it's not a surprise why most businesses aren't as innovative as they like to pretend they are. No, and I think it goes hand in hand, which I love, which you and I both share the, with the idea of vulnerability. Because when you're vulnerable and open and willing to say, here's what I'm not good at, that's when you can build those great yeah. relationships. Brene, Brene Brown talks about this. She goes, yeah. we don't actually build trust when we offer our help. We build trust when we ask for it. Totally. Yeah, because it's the most vulnerable time. Like, it's like, you don't know where this is going to go. And when people in positions of authority ask for help, mm. it's even more amazing. Yeah, it's funny. I, I um, have shared openly, like, some of my own experiences with actually sometimes being the boss and not knowing the answers when there's people who work for you who know it so much better than you, and you kind of have this feeling of, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm supposed to have the answers. And it's so intimidating. But when you actually just come out and say, I really don't know, can you help me? It's incredible. Suddenly the whole conversation opens up. So and it makes them feel valuable and valued, and they have something to contribute, and that yes. all of their hard work is worth something. And it's, 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 it has multiple layers of goodness. Totally. So one question I, I want to explore with you, because you shared with me um, in the early days of starting your own business, when you had peers around you who were doing similar things and seemingly accelerating faster than you were, <laughs> and you Absolutely were, were, and you just kind of, and they were giving you advice, no, you should be doing this way, you should be doing this yeah. way, and you knew to stick with what you were doing, because I think one of the things I actually talk a lot about in my book is this need to not try and keep up with the Joneses because yeah. we're never as good when we're an imitation Jones as we are our, our best selves. Yeah. But how, you were young in that example. Like how did you know to stick with what you felt was right even when on the short-term surface it looked like your results were not proving it out? Well, it was, uh, it was very scary. I mean, it wasn't, it was nerve-wracking. Um, 
what Sarah is referring to is, is I, I, as I was getting going and this whole start with white thing was beginning, uh, I made no money. I made I made so little money; it was unbelievable. And uh, we could we could barely pay our bills. I was scraping by, and there were uh, friends I had who were sort of did similar things, and they were consultants, and I didn't know what I was. Maybe I was a consultant, and they would give me this, and they were making coin, you know, two three hundred thousand dollars a year. And they were giving me this advice about what I should be doing. And it was uncomfortable because it did two things. It made me feel stupid because I wasn't doing them. And it was uncomfortable because I didn't want to do it their way because it just felt smarmy to me. Like, like some of the stuff they told me, just like it didn't feel like me. But I knew that they knew what they were doing and that they were, knew what they were talking about. And I knew that they were trying to help me. And if I just did what they said, I too could be making coin. Right? But I wasn't driven by the coin. That was the other problem. And for me, I'd rather struggle and do the right thing and be happy than uh, not struggle, do the wrong thing, and actually ultimately not be happy. You know, uh, and, and I, I guess I'm just lucky. I had great parents who sort of instilled that in us and a good network of people who I, you know, I, I knew that if I ran out of money, I wouldn't die. I'd be humiliated, I'd have to sleep on a couch, I'd have to move back in with my parents, but death was not the immediate. And people are like, oh, I need this job to survive. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you don't. Uh, and I believed in something. I mean, there's, there's a reason why people do crazy things for love, irrational things for love. Or when you have a vision, it's irrational, and that's the point. And I believed in something and that drove me. It was like a religion for me, this why thing. And so I ignored all the advice. And it hurt because he made more coin and I made no more coin. <laughs> Until things started to go. And what I realized is all the hard work that I was doing, spreading my message, spreading my message, being consistent, preaching what I believed, doing things the way I wanted to do it, working only with people. I was making no money and I would have people call me to hire me and I would turn them away because I knew that they were the wrong people for me to work with. I, if somebody called me and said, convince me why I should hire you, I would say, don't. Because I ain't convincing anybody. I ain't in the sales business. You either believe what I believe or you don't, and I am not going to convince you to hire me or drop my price to do it or whatever it is. Stupid idiot. But eventually, what I did was I only attracted people who believed what I believed. And you know what happens when you only work with people who believe what you believe? They become your single biggest champions. And then people would recommend me. And it was a lot slower, but it was a lot more stable. I've never advertised or marketed Start With Why, the book. I've, I, I, I've, I've never had a, a publicist for like one week at the beginning because the publisher told me I had to. That was a disaster. <laughs> I've ostensibly, he didn't do anything. So I've ostensibly never had a, a, a publicist. The reason Start With Why continues to sell better than it's ever sold, and it's been on the market for eight, this is its eighth year, has nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with me. It's of all the amazing, wonderful people who, rose, who raised their hand and said, I believe, and they told their friend, read this book. And, and that's, that's what mattered. So how I do have, I bet you a lot of people want to ask this question. It's like, because when you're trying to get your belief out into the world yeah. or your idea or whatever it is. It's funny, I, I'm reading um, Bruce Springsteen's memoir at the moment, if anyone's read it. It's amazing. And you, you, you go back to those years of playing in tiny little <coughs> dirty you know, bars with four people. And like, how do you know when to stick with it? How do you know, how do you know that it will eventually get there? Because I'm sure a lot of people ask that question is like, when... Should I quit because it really isn't going to take off? Have you ever dated somebody who is so out of your league? Like so much better looking than you should be dating? And you somehow convince yourself and tell your friends, no, no, she's, she's the one. But deep, deep down inside, you know, come on, we don't even like get along. Like it's just, come on. Like deep down inside, like where you don't want to admit it, you're, you're being superficial, right? And, and we've all been there, we've all done it, and maybe not, unless you're that person. Like, uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. 
But you kid yourself. You know, we take the, the fast money, we're like, this is it. But you're like, no, no. It's like, if you have any sense of self whatsoever, you know. It's the, que the question is, are you willing to make a decision based on that? And, uh, you know, there's decisions that are for show. And there are decisions that are the right thing to do. And, you know, when, I, when, I, when the whole why thing started, I actually, I realized the business that I was in, this marketing consulting business, that I, I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to do this why thing. And so I, like all my employees left, I'm, I managed to negotiate out of my lease because I had an office. And all my friends thought I went bankrupt. All my friends thought I went out of business. And nothing could be further from the truth. And sometimes we make decisions for appearances. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I got over that hump that I made the decision because it was the right decision, even though the appearance was really bad. Yeah. You know, I was now working by myself out of my sister's living room. I used to have an office and, and blue chip clients and employees. And, uh, and I was okay with that. No, I know that feeling. It's funny, I, I think a lot of us go through that. Like I personally quit my job a year ago and I remember suddenly going from being highfalutin corporate person with, you know, all the trappings to like backpacking around to Starbucks to have my meetings. And You are Australian. I, New Zealand. Did you seriously? Oh. Whoa. Whoa. I actually knew you were a Kiwi too. Because we were just <laughs> talking did. about it last yeah, week. We did. I was very oh. sick. Oh, uh, well, should I forgive him? Okay. What People call me Canadian all the time. <laughs> That's true. Actually, I did think you were English at one So, time. I am English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But your accent? Is mid-Atlantic. There we Mid-Atlantic. Like now middle of the Atlantic perfect. Ocean. All right, I think we're getting the cue that it's time for a Q and a All right. Is there any, uh, I think we've got that's some a, mics a, around a, here. So, guy, so we, we have a bunch more time, but, but we love to open it up and yeah. extend the conversation in a circular yes, fashion. Yes, for sure. And, but although one thing I'd love to tee it off with before, before we get our first questions is, I, is the one story we've not yet gotten is the extraordinary story of why Sarah Rob O'Hagan wrote this book. And, oh. I, and I love it extremely, and I, and, and I love the story of how you were sitting there, yeah. and your bio was being described in front of a large audience of all these accolades of having taken over a billion dollar company, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd love to tee you up to tell that, because I think it's such a great, great I've heard story. this. This is yeah. good. You've got to tell it. <laughs> oh, no. So, it, and it does tee into everything we've been talking about. So, we, um, yeah, I had this really uncomfortable experience about probably seven or eight years ago, when I was giving a speech to a thousand people and the projector broke, sweat bullets on my forehead. It was not going well. But then the girl comes out to read my bio and says all this like, you know, Fast Company's most creative people in business and Forbes' most powerful women in sports. And I literally remember sitting there squirming because I was like, she's saying all this amazing shit that makes me sound amazing and she's missing the got fired twice in her 20s, like, was very average in childhood, et cetera, et cetera. Bushy eyebrows. Bushy eyebrows. <laughs> Man-sized feet. Like, whew, like, <laughs> let's just keep going. And, and I, it led me to this, this realization that I've, I believe that our culture of success, which is very tied up to everything that you've been studying, has taken us to this crazy place that it's all about perfection and we put people on pedestals. It's the 40 under the 40, the 30 under 30, the 20 under 20. My literary agent was telling me about, she was asked to do a deal for a 12-year-old YouTube star for his life story. I'm like, for shit sakes. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and you know where I'm going with it? It was just like, it's time we just started having an honest conversation about... <laughs> what it really takes to be fulfilled, actually. And um, so I ended up beginning the journey of wanting to write a book, and I actually ended up interviewing extraordinarily successful people, as the world would define them, Condoleezza Rice, who, by the way, opens up saying, oh, I was a failed piano major, who would have thought? <laughs> Bodie Miller, the downhill skier who crashes more than any other skier, and that's why he became our most decorated downhill skier. I can go on and on. But what I learned along the way, and I essentially took all of these lessons and codified it into a method for how to get the most out of yourself, is pretty much everything that you've been talking about tonight, which is it's okay not to know at the age of 20 where you're going. It's okay to screw up a ton. It's okay to do not sexy jobs just because you're di discovering and learning who you are. And it's okay to have huge feet if you're a woman too, <laughs> by the way. 
And um, like embrace your imperfections, really, and just be the best of who you are. Because when you stand on that strong foundation, particularly if you aspire to leadership, you have to have a strong foundation to have the courage when the, you know, the winds are coming against you. And so I think that was really the lesson of the book. I, I, I mean, I, I, this is the reason I love... Yeah, applaud. This is, the, this is the reason I love spending time with Sarah. Like, whenever we get together, um, we, there's a lot of laughing, there's a lot of self-deprecation, and uh, it makes me always walk away feeling I'm fine, you know? <laughs> like, if there was any doubt whatsoever that I was having that day, like, it's okay. And you're so good, you're so good at sort of pointing out your own foibles that it makes the rest of us more comfortable to recognize that we're kind of funny looking too, you know? <laughs> and, and it's really a magical thing. And I, I really hope, I, I, I hope everybody reads your book, but I really hope young people read your book. I really do. Because I think yours is the antidote for the overwhelming pressure that is being put on them. And, and even, I just, and, I, and more than read it, I hope they, they, whether they give it to a friend or buy it for a friend, I hope they talk about it with their friends. I hope they choose to become the you yeah. that you are for me, you know? Uh, so. Oh. <laughs> uh, do we have some questions? And we have a tambourine. It's all good. Yes, I will pass it around. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for sharing all your uh, thoughts tonight. Uh, so, um, I'm following this podcast called Dharma Punks by uh, a wonderful Buddhist teacher called Jeff Korda. And he pointed out one time saying that normally when you come into the office, somebody asks you, uh, how are you doing today? You may sometimes just want to say, awful, I didn't sleep all night, I had insomnia, I had all the angst about what I really want to do in my life and all of that. But of course, we're not going to do that, right? We are going to be... Um, amicable, we're going to be professional and all those kinds of things. But I think you pointed out a very important thing of gathering those people around you that you can be honest with, that you can be, you know, in a tribal sort of relationship with that are going to support your goals of growth in a particular direction. So my question to you is how do you identify the people that you want to bring into your tribe and then also how do you maintain that relationship that seems to be um, you know, it has to be intentional, it has to be deliberate, um, and uh, definitely aligned with your own core values. So how do you identify the tribe that's going to help you, um, you know, go out of your day job into that entrepreneurial uh, leadership role that you want to be? It's a great question. And um, it's funny, like one of the things I really believe, which it sounds like you have a similar experience, is... I think, particularly when we're younger, you tend to, you know, think classic high school. You just gravitate to the people like you because it's comfortable and you're like a little tribe and you're all dressed in the same stuff and it feels good. But as you get older, it's funny. I, I don't know if I meant to do it or it just happened, but I, having read your book, actually, where it talks about looking back on the decisions that have made you great, I had this moment somewhere in my 30s where I look back and I realized that my greatest moments in my career, I had been very closely partnered with an introvert. And in case you haven't noticed, I'm an extrovert. And that was very profound for me because it made me realize that it was the partnership with someone who slowed me down, who was so different and thoughtful and would make me think differently that helped bring out more in me. And that led me into a whole kind of understanding that I've got to do this across every aspect. Like having that self-awareness to answer your question, knowing where your shining strengths are, where are your areas of vulnerability where you need to surround yourself with that tribe so that you kind of have that with you as, as you move forward. And chances are that person's going to be needing you as well. Like you both go hand in hand. And I think that's where the real powerful relationships come in. I mean, look, you know how to do it. It's called making friends. Like, we know, we know how to do this. We're, it's, it's, it's in our DNA. And, uh, and the problem is, is, is you asked for a checklist, and I can't give you a checklist on how to make friends. I can't give you a checklist on how to fall in love. I can tell you some of the things you should do, but even if you just do those things, it won't work. And so I think there's an element of patience, and there's also an element of, of uh, sacrifice. 
which is you won't make friends if you, if you expect them to be giving to you the whole time. If you, if you live in expectation the whole time uh, and you fail to appreciate, and, and I've learned this recently, there was a, I can't remember her name, she's this wonderful Indian guru, uh, and she, she, she was talking, there's two ways to live your life. You can live a life of, st of happiness or you can live a life of stress. And people who live a life of stress live their lives in expectation. Where people who live a life of happiness live their lives in appreciation. Right? And, and little things. So I, pr I practice this. I like to practice advice that's given to me in really innocuous, silly ways. Because if it works in something silly, it probably works in something big. So I'm sitting in, in a coffee shop and I order toast and that comes out cold. Now I expect my toast to be at least lukewarm. <laughs> Because you want the butter to melt on it right. a little. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I'm like... <laughs> you know, I'm looking to get new toast. And it occurs to me what I'm doing, which is I am living expectation and I'm suffering stress. So I go, how nice of that man to bring me a nice piece of toast. And I was good. Yeah. And it was amazing how quickly awesome. I was totally fine with cold toast. <laughs> so, yeah, the opportunity to go from expectation to appreciation, I think, is how you make friends. Great, great insight. Hi, Hi. I have a question. Um, I wanted to go back to your point about the fear of failure. And I was wondering if you have any idea on where it comes from, because we often have this conversation, my boyfriend and I, about whether it comes from the education system, because I'm French educated and the French seem to have um, no tolerance uh, for trial. So you're not even encouraged to attempt because of uh, the fear of failure. Whereas my understanding of the American culture is that you're free to attempt as much as you want and failure is not a... But I don't know, it seems what, from what you were saying that the new generation has a major fear of failure. So as if you're saying that maybe the generation before doesn't have that notion. I just wanted to have a sense of... I, I wonder though if it's related to your expectation versus appreciation because funnily enough, I, I personally, I come from one of the smallest countries in the world, right? And so Australia. Australia. <laughs> we have... New Zealand has three million people. We have four million people, thank you, and 50 million sheep, like count all of us, thank you. But this is significant because I, you grew up in France, I grew up in a small country. 55 and I, million people. Yeah, there we go, exactly. I have what I call the underdog advantage because I believe when you come from these small places, you don't have expectations that you're going to win all the gold medals at the Olympics. You know, it's so funny. The Americans, it's like, if we don't dominate, we will be so mad. The Kiwis, like, get a bronze. It's like, woo, you know? And, and, and I do... Ah, there you are. So, it's, but it, I do think it's, it's related to your expectation versus appreciation. I think if you expect things and then fail, there's a fear in it. Whereas if you kind of go, I'm just going to swing and I'm going to enjoy what happens either way and don't worry so much. I, I mean, there's a biology to it as well. The reason we fear failure is because uh, uh, biologically, death follows, you know? <laughs> so, wow. and what I mean by that is there's a, an, a, there's a chemical in our body called cortisol, which is which is the chemical responsible for stress and anxiety, it's basically an early warning alarm system. So do you ever see like um, a gazelle when they hear a rustle on the grass, they go, <gasps> right? That's cortisol. That's what it does, right? And cortisol is designed to keep us alive, right? And um, the reason, you know, lions, when they go after the gazelle, they go after the old or the sick or the young because they're easy to catch, right? So when you're old, sick, or young, you are afraid, and the same is true for human beings, which is we have this, we want to be in the circle of safety, just like a, a herd of gazelle. And if we're the weak one, if we're the failure, the, the cortisol that builds up in our system, literally, it feels like we're going to be the one pushed out to the margins, which is what we do with people. We push them to the margins. That's why outsiders are called outsiders. We push them to the margins. And the fear of death is so overwhelming of being pushed outside the tribe that sometimes they hurt themselves, they hurt others, right? Um, and so the fear of failure is very, very real. 
What you want culturally is to build that circle of safety. Europe doesn't have that culture of uh, acceptance when somebody tries and fails, right? Which is why there tends to be a lot less entrepreneurship, right? America, going right back to its roots, hey, let's give this whole new country thing a try, right? As long as you're surrounded by people who like, hey, if it doesn't work out, don't worry, right? You gotta, it's got to be cultural. It's got to be that circle of safety gives us the impetus to try. America, we love the trier. Oh, yeah, I started a business and failed. That's so great that you try to start a business. Like, we love it. So they're absolutely, to your point about the underdog, the four million, you know, population country, there, of course, of course, there are cultural elements. But it's not an American thing versus a rest of the world thing. Four million population gives you a circle of safety that we're all in this together and we know we're not the yeah. best, so we better take care of each other. Right? So, uh, and so, the, no matter where you're from or what country you're from, the opportunity is to find or if you don't find if you kind of build the circle of safety and what you will find is innovation entrepreneurship and all kinds of wonderful things that risk that will happen inside that circle quick question um the, what you what you've said is is revelatory but at the same time i'm kind of terrified that it's revelatory which is a, a conundrum that i think you're you're sensing which is um I mean, you've said a couple of times that uh, that you know people have said that you're courageous for the you know the things that you've done and assessed, but you've had a sense of humility of that that there are other people who maybe are more courageous. Um, I wonder, um, so much of of psychology, American worldwide, currently seems now to come out of TED talks, you know, out of books, uh, sort of post business, and the order seems to be. You know, success, business, deep breath, book, TED Talk, psychology, um, which which is which is great. I mean, the fact the fact of that, and I'm not I'm not saying for either of you, but 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 sort of the, the pattern of it. I mean, I walk I'm and pre sort of pre warning. I'm a psychiatrist, but I I wander around the airport bookstores and I read. I pick up you know all of the the you know the books um, in the airport and and take them on the planes and read them, and they're great. Um, but they they get there, they seem to get there sort of after what you guys are talking about, after sort of the, the chomping at the bit for success. And then when there's a breather, uh, there's the time to kind of catch up and think, what does this all really mean? And I think it's fantastic, but at the same time, I'm wondering from you guys, do you think about uh, in this culture, is there a time, a way, a place to instill the values of thinking about those things before sort of going for the brass ring to affect the way that we go for the brass ring rather than getting there first and then taking a break and thinking about it afterwards. Very good point. That was a, that was a question worth asking. Yes. Very good point. So I'm not sure I agree with the premise uh, of, of the order of things. And I think what we do is we construct uh, formulas for success based on uh, either incorrect or limited data. So, for example, the number of people today who think that becoming a billionaire at 28 is their standard, I got some bad news for you, right? First of all, the number of people who become billionaires is very, very small at all. The number who make it before they're 30 is even smaller, and there's a reason we call those companies in Silicon Valley unicorns, it's because they, 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 they're rare. They barely exist. And some of them are geniuses. And you can tell because they can repeat it. But some of them won the lottery. Make no mistake of it. And they were on the cover of all the magazines a few years ago. Now we've never heard of them. Do you remember Groupon? Right? So, yeah, not so much anymore, right? The point is, is they won the lottery, and then they go in the speaking circuit and get book deals as if they know how to build a business, and they basically tell people all the lottery numbers they chose, and you think if you pick the same numbers, you're going to have the same... That's not how it works. So I think we take our cues, quite frankly, from faulty data. And we have faulty expectations. And I think the breathing happens along the way. I think the smart ones are the ones, at some point, it's usually pain, agony, and failure that is hidden and buried and part of 
either folklore or it just happened years ago. I went through it, you went through it. Uh, uh, never, none of us want to repeat it, but we're super glad it happened. Um, and that's when the breath happens, when you're forced to take the breath. Or you get divorced, or you get your heart broken, or something happens to one of your kids, or you lose somebody close to you, and all of a sudden perspective is forced into you very suddenly. I wish that's not how it happened, but that's kind of the hubris of man. That's kind of how it happens. We have to get smacked upside the head. So I, I, I think that the way, the formula that you're talking about is nothing more than opportunism. Somebody is popular on YouTube, a publisher says, throw some money at them, get a book, let's capitalize on this before it runs out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, and then we consider that normal. It's not normal. as the kind of, as a leader, and what do you feel like you really have to work on? Well, I, I will say it's a little bit related to your question, too, is that I think, um, maybe this is way oversimplifying it, but we talk a lot about the differences in the generations, the boomers, the Gen X, millennials, but we sometimes forget that I think throughout all humanity, in your 20s, you're a certain way, in your 30s, and your 40s, etc., because I, I was going to answer your question, I'm going to get back to this a little bit, by saying that I think on some level you actually you have to have a certain amount of years of just experience under your belt before you even realise you need to take a breath, I think. And so to answer your question, because I, I, I agree with what you just said, like I was I had smack up the heads in crazy ways in terms of landing in environments that just didn't work for me where I just epically failed, got laid off, whatever it was. And you actually need those experiences to help refine where you want to be. And you also need, which is what Simon said, amazing role models. And that's the other thing I feel has gone a little bit haywire in our culture today of this kind of instant gratification, I need to be a, on the cover of a magazine at 25, is that I feel so lucky that I had amazing role models. We, I have a friend up the front here. We both worked for a guy in our 20s who I wanted to model my leadership style off. And I was able to see and learn from someone in front of me every day who could smack me around as well and tell me, here's what you're doing right and here's what you're doing wrong. And I think for me in the end, that's how I started to hone what my own personal style was. And it has to be your personal style. Everyone's going to be a little bit different, but it does take time. And that's why I feel stressed every time I hear a you know, college graduate saying to me, well, I have to find my passion and get into the right job. And it's like, it takes a while and it's okay. It takes a while. <laughs> and don't worry if, I mean, some of the wonderful stories in my book, I, I actually interviewed um, Sam Cass, who's the former White House chef, who was spending all this time trying to be a professional baseball player for years while his friends were making coin as consultants. <laughs> And, you know, everyone's saying you're going in the wrong direction until he eventually finds this passion for food and cooking. Look where he ended up. And it's okay. It takes a minute. And I think that's all right. So what's that got to do with having room full of educated people? <laughs> no, serious question. Oh, careful, careful, careful. I know a lot of really educated people with lots of opportunity who have no fulfillment in their lives. And I know some janitors who love what they do, right? I'll tell you about a company called the Luck Companies. It's based outside, of, just out near Dulles Airport outside in Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, this company, what they do for a living is they own quarries, which means they smash rocks. The way that works is there's a big hole in the ground. They stick a stick of dynamite in a hole. It blows big boulders. 
people take those big boulders, make them into smaller boulders, and then put them on a machine and crush it into small rock, and they sell little rocks. That's what they do. We went out and visited them, uh, and we sat around a table with their frontline employees. Most don't have uh, high school educations. They probably have high school equivalencies. None have college educations. Um, they fit every stereotype you can imagine. Three fitty baseball cap, dip in the cheek, named Bubba, right? Like every stereotype you got, they, that's true. And I said to them, tell me what it is that you love about working at luck companies. And one guy who fits every stereotype you can imagine leans forward, he says, well, working here, I've learned to communicate my feelings. And I can say to my colleagues, if I'm feeling frustrated or angry, or how I can say thank you, and it's been kind of amazing, and I really love coming to work here, and I feel like I'm a part of a team. It's actually improved my relationship with my wife and my kids. That guy has passion like you cannot believe. So be very, very careful about, about saying that passion for your work versus passion at work, right? So there are plenty of jobs that are not glamorous, but it's the people with whom we work, it's the way our leaders make us feel that we show up to do our work with passion every day, even if the work we do is unglamorous or not passion-forming. In fact, I would venture to say, it goes back to dating that, that girl who I thought was right for me, you know, uh, that sometimes we're attracted to jobs that are in tech or glamorous or on television because we think that because it has glamour, we will be, it'll be passionate. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is always the people with whom we work. Always. That's where the passion comes from. It goes back to those Navy SEALs. One more question. Um, Lucky last. And that's what Sarah does, by the way. The businesses that she goes into and turns around, some of them are great-looking businesses, and some of them are not that great-looking businesses. <laughs> but what she does, first and foremost, is she doesn't start changing the product. She starts taking care of the people. She comes in and makes cultural change. And amazingly, the business takes off. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, so, oh, uh, so I was at the NPD group, which is the. Just talk. Oh, so I was at the NPD group, which is the number one research company in the world. They serve like ninety percent of the Fortune five hundred. And what was interesting is the CEO said the number one. Uh, company that teens are buying, consumers under 21, so Generation Z, is makeup, and it's Sephora. And it's like, so I'm 17, so like I'll be hanging out with like high school girls, and they'll take a selfie for Instagram, and they'll filter it up, and they'll post it, and if in five minutes, if they don't get enough likes, they'll be like, oh, I'm taking it down. So I'm, I'm really curious to, to get your guys' opinion on so the cell phone, we, like we've grown up, we don't know a world where we can't FaceTime our friend, order pizza, and call our mom all at the same time. So how do you think that's going to evolve? Like, how do you think that's going to evolve with how we look at ourselves, how we're integrating that with our everyday life and questions and stuff like that? You have a lot of... <laughs> that's big, about this. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. Hey, you guys can think about it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> So, so do, you know, do you want to know which demographic has the highest increase of suicide? Girls, 10 to 15 years old. It has tripled in the past 15 years. Tripled. Girls also engage on social media 40% more than boys. Uh, and there's obviously, it's not obviously a causal relation, but there's, a, there's clearly a correlation. And I think it is unbelievably irresponsible for marketers to say, well, if girls are taking pictures of themselves, how do we get in there and get them to take more pictures of themselves? I think it is disgusting, right? The question is, how do we help children form relationships with other children, right? And marketers should be interrupting that experience so that they grow up with a sense of self-worth beyond how many followers they have. But marketers are the most irresponsible people on the planet because when they sniff a dollar and they do things like this, they say, the trend, the trend is that kids are using apps these days more. Let's make more apps. No, no, no. The trend is you needed to take cocaine to get through the workday in the 1980s. 
That doesn't mean give them more cocaine. That is a trend. Doesn't mean it's a healthy trend. And I think it's responsible marketers who work very, very, very hard to understand if the trend is healthy or not. And for them to place their product either for if it's healthy or against the trend. And that is what produces unbelievably loyal customers because you've actually achieved value. You've actually improved their lives. So when you're asking me, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That is a horrific thing. You know, alcoholics, when they suffer stress, they drink instead of turning to a person. So who are we to interrupt them and say that's not healthy and maybe it'll make it worse if we try and intervene? What you're talking about is addiction in children, right? So simply to say they won't is madness. I know a family who struggles with their 14-year-old, this thing. The kid is addicted to his cell phone. Okay? They cannot get this kid at the dinner table. They can't get this kid to have a conversation. The kid is afraid of answering the front door because there's a person there. Okay? So what did the family do? They went on a family vacation, and no one was allowed to bring any phones. They brought one phone, okay, in case for emergencies or did whatever, one family phone. And here's what happened. It was the worst vacation they ever had for the first three days. I was going to say. I, yeah. For the first three days, they were at each other's throats. They were complaining. They were pissed off. And then something amazing happened. They bonded. It was the best family vacation they ever had. So if taking it away for 10 minutes, the kid's going to scream. Taking it away for a day, the kid's going to complain, hate you, and suffer from withdrawal system, symptoms. There's a program to beat addiction, and we are not implementing it because we don't like the anger that, is, that comes from it. I can, and I would say, as a parent, by the way, I have almost teenagers, that it, it is incumbent upon the marketers, for sure, but it's incumbent upon every older generation. Like... Every aspect of what we do, uh, it's funny, I literally just went away with my family and we went on a three-day hike where there was no power, let alone cell phones. <laughs> and they, you're, it was like the first few hours, they were just like, what? And then it was extraordinary. Like, I've never seen such wonderful connection out of a group of, what was, 16 young children. And it's on us. Like, I feel like this whole epidemic with what you're describing is like... I grew up with smoking. Like once upon a time, we thought it was cool to smoke. And then as the adults finally figured out that was a really bad idea, we have to do the same thing. It's on us. And I think we have a lot of work to do. No, they know how to do the addiction because they build it into the code. So <laughs> let, let, me, let's, let, me, let me sum up, right? If you've noticed everything we've said from the conversation we had with each other, to answering the questions, there's an underlying theme, right? And this is why I love Sarah Rob O'Hagan, and this is why I love the book that you've written, right? Which is fundamentally what we're talking about. How many of you came here with somebody? Okay, look at that. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Which is we'd rather do things with somebody we like or love or care about than do things alone. It's called being human. And fundamentally what I talk about, what Sarah talks about, the stuff that I sort of get on my high horse about and sort of my soapbox, the stuff that you build businesses around, because there's two sides of the same coin here, and now the book that Sarah's written is fundamentally just about being human and having relationships and taking care of each other. And if you walk away with one thing and if you learn anything from Sarah and her work, it's like just take care of people. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much okay. for coming.